first I will um, explain, I guess the, I want to set the scene by um, giving you the, the coalition story on um, where we're at with the deficit and uh, austerity and uh, needing to uh, pay off this uh, crippling debt. Um, the coalition uh, have been telling us with, with a really kind of iron discipline, I mean Tory and Liberal Democrat ministers, MPs alike have been hammering this home week after week after week, the last 18 months at least, saying that UK deficit and debt are out of control um, because of Labour's overspending, uh, the principal villain of the piece being Gordon Brown, of course. Um, by May 2010, uh, this had reached unsustainable levels, we're told, um, risking an increase in government borrowing costs, the famous bond vigilantes poised to strike, um, meaning that, unfortunately, um, it's always said with kind of hand-wringing. Um, severe austerity eliminating the structural deficit. I'm as sceptical as Anne was about what that actually means, structural in practice, but we'll come back to that. Eliminating the structural deficit over the course of this one parliament, so a very, very big fiscal consolidation in five years, is the only course of action left to the UK, and uh, this will enable us to get into the sunny uplands of uh, sustainable private sector growth by kind of cutting back the, the state, the private sector will begin to flourish. So this is, this is what we're told in four bullet points. In one sentence, um, David Cameron says, if you have maxed out your credit card, if you put off dealing with the problem, the problem gets worse. Um, Cameron said that, Osborne said that, and I'm sure there's a quote from Nick Clegg um, kicking around somewhere. He's normally in the background. Um, making a nasty noise whenever anything happens with this, with this government. Um, so that's, 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 the kind of, that's what we've been told. Um, this talk is really trying to put the record straight. And I'll concentrate on three points, although there's a lot of other things related to it that we can discuss uh, in the session afterwards. Um, the first thing I want to show is that every part of the coalition story is at least partially wrong, and in many cases, completely wrong. Um, a mis just a misconception and a, a distortion. Um, austerity, uh, far from being the ticket to the promised land, has been a disaster and I think will continue to be so for some time to come. And thirdly, I want to say, well, if, you know, if all the evidence points to the, the fact that what we're doing at the moment is disaster, how are they getting away with it? Why is the narrative so, per so per pervasive? Um, and our, our, the last couple of slides will talk about that. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of graphs. So some, some of my graphs are pretty similar to Anne's. This one's slightly different. Um, this is what, if, if I was, um, a, say, a, a Conservative or Liberal Democrat minister um, defending what's being done at the moment, I'd put this graph up. Okay, and it's, it's, it's government uh, tax receipts in the green line and uh, public spending, including investment spending, um, both as a share of GDP... Um, starting in 96-97, so we can see what happens when new Labour comes along. Spending's already running ahead of receipts uh, from about 2002 onwards. And then you see when we get to the, uh, the, the financial crisis, the Great Recession of 2008, um, the spending line just kind of goes, whoa, goes up from 40% to, you know, 48%, the peak in about 2009-10. And then we see the coalition... Uh, unfortunate but we're told um, inevitable unavoidable medicine uh, getting uh, spending including investment down uh, having been out of control for those few years after the after the crash um, so that's the that's that that's the way they present it um, if you use a slightly different depiction of the same data you can see what's really getting going on I think this is exactly the same to the, 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 the two lines here are exactly the same information, but rather than using share of GDP, I'm using just nominal spending in billions of pounds. Okay, um, So what you can see here is you can see an upward trend in spending over time, but that's to be expected because, you know, given that we have inflation, etc., and given that um, GDP is rising in real terms for most of the period, you'd expect that to be happening. And receipts are also going up over time. Um, not quite as not quite as fast, um, and there is you know there is a slight gap between the two by 2007 eight. But I'll come back to that on the next slide. And then what you see is that receipts basically fell off a cliff um, after 2007 eight, and that's what opens up that huge gap. Okay, so it's not a spurge in spending; it's a fall off in tax revenue. 
that's causing that. If I change the yellow line slightly so that I am putting on current spending only, not investment spending, you'll see that um, up to 2007-8, the government was meeting its kind of fiscal fiscal rule of um, only borrowing to invest over the cycle reasonably well. Now, there are issues because obviously, you know, there were there were problems with the economy, imbalances by 2006 7 growing private debt, all the rest of it, um, the huge problems of the financial situation. I'm not saying everything was, you know, hunky-dory by 07, but you can see clearly that there's the massive drop-off in tax receipts, um, 07, 08, 08, 09, and that's what's opening up that big, that big gap. Um, and um, furthermore, you can see that a huge reduction in the growth of the growth path of um, spending, um, some of which is cut off in investment, but some of it's just a big spending squeeze, which I'll come back to um, in the coalition plans 2011 through to 2016-17. So I don't think it's a case of overspending. I think it's a case that tax revenue collapsed. There was a close track between current spending and tax revenue track uh, uh, between prior to 2007, eight. there was a lot of a lot of um, public investment going on, but you'd expect that because you know um, any business would would invest to uh, create a stream of revenue later, and government with infrastructure spending doing exactly the same thing. Furthermore, with borrowing rates as low as they were, and I'll show you some information on borrowing rates in a minute, it would have been actually irrational not to have public investment under those circumstances. It would have been silly to turn down uh, public investment opportunities. So I think what was going on prior to 2007-08 was reasonably sensible, uh, notwithstanding the problems of um, financial sector running out of control and so forth. The Great Recession of 2008 did cause a collapse in tax revenues, a really big collapse. Um, and a lot of that was due to fragility. I mean, we had a huge, uh, a huge hole in the corporate tax balance sheet. Corporate receipts kind of fell off a cliff. Um, the financial sector was a big part of that because suddenly these guys were running huge losses, and before that they'd been racking up huge profits. Also, rising unemployment, uh, lower wage growth, all of that, all of that affects the income tax and national insurance receipts. And lower spending mean lower VAT receipts. So a lot of that was kind of um, it was a big slump. And that meant that spending after 2007-8 was essential. If we hadn't put our spending up uh, quite a lot after that, we would have, you know, we would have had a deepening economic depression um, because output would have fallen even more, and we would have had even less tax revenue. So there was an obvious kind of uh, Keynesian uh, cyclical rationale for increased spending after 2007-8, uh, both through what are called the automatic stabilisers. Um, unemployment benefits, um, the fact that people moving out of work don't pay tax, etc. Um, and also um, the, the limited fiscal stimulus we did have, I'm thinking mainly of the VAT cut, which, which, which helped for a year or so in 2009 until it was withdrawn. So all that I think was essential and um, you know, very, very proper. Um, now the second, the second thing the coalition says is that debt reached unsustainable levels. And again, if I was the the coalition spokesman presenting this here today, I would give you um, this graph uh, with this scale, this horizontal scale. Starting in '97, you can see that the the government, um, the previous government, had a thing called sustainable investment rule, right, which is that the net public sector debt to GDP ratio should always be below 40%. And you can say, see that from from the time that just after they took office. Um, through to 2007, they were meeting that, just about, okay? And then it looks like you've got this huge kind of upward trend in debt, um, up to 70%. And then after 2012, I've got the projections from the Office for Budget Responsibility showing a peak at around uh, 78% in 2015. So, you know, big increase in debt on that scale. Now, if you change the, the horizontal scale, you'll see this in some real economic historic perspective. Economics are very ahistorical um, science for, for many economists. They don't really know what happened, you know, before two years ago in the Economic Journal or whatever. If you show them what happened, you see that in 1945 or 1946, the peak of that, uh, that graph, uh, net debt GDP ratio peaked at about 240%. Okay? Now, if the credit card was maxed out in 2011, then you know we were we were sort of triple maxed out um, in 1946. So you know why didn't the 
economy just collapse. It didn't collapse. We, we, uh, the Attlee government built the welfare state, NHS, etc. And you know, steady growth um, combined with uh, moderate inflation through the 50s, 60s, even the uh, even the early 70s saw that debt to GDP ratio just just fall, you know, pretty much continuously um, in a curve until it reached around sort of 45 percent in 19. 80. So you can see, you know, that that, that, that by, by the standards of the of the post-war period, the debt levels of 2011, 2012 are by no means unsustainable. If you go back even further, taking it back to 1700, as long as uh, as long back as there's any kind of reliable data, you see that the that the, the the kind of post uh, 1975 period is very unusual. Only in the late 19th century and early 20th have we had debt levels anywhere near as low as that and in the very start of the period. In fact, for most of this, you know, we were maxed out, or much more than maxed out, for the whole 18th century, for most of the 19th, and indeed for the interwar period and World War II, and most of the... You know, there, there, there's a lot of maxing out going on here, is all I can say. You know, we, we seem to be maxed, uh, maxed out squared. Yeah, um, so is this really... Uns is our current debt level unsustainable? Historical, start, uh, historical perspective would suggest it's not. Um, Looking at it a slightly different way, because so, so, sometimes the coalition takes a slightly different tack to say that debt interest payments are unsustainable, so they, they make it a year-on-year -year thing rather than the stock of debt. But debt interest payments on UK debt are so low now by historical standards that we're actually paying substantially less than we were in, say, the 1980s under the uh, uh, Mrs Thatcher's administration and also under most of the John Major period. So, so, so actually using debt interest instead of the, the, the debt stock um, makes the point uh, I was making previously even more strongly. Um, now, I don't often put um, formulae uh, equations in my talks, um, mainly because when I write them down, I normally write them down wrong. And uh, I've actually done that here. So this, the, but this is, the, 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 it's only a minor fault. The, the, the left-hand side should be changing debt debt GDP ratio from T to T plus one. So it's like del just imagine a triangle on the left hand side there for delta, right? What I'm trying to do here is show um, what determines the path of debt GDP over time. Um, what uh, I think there's basically three factors. Um, one is the small d there, that's the deficit that you run uh, this year um, as a proportion of the GDP. Uh, R is the real interest rate that you're paying on servicing your debt, and G is the real growth rate of GDP. Okay, and those three factors are R minus G. Uh, you multiply by your existing stock of debt, and that shows that plus your deficit for this year shows you what your debt stock will be next year. Now, by looking at that, um, without trying to freak people out with maths too much, starting imagine that that's in a steady state of constant debt year on year. So your real debt GDP is just kind of it's just trundling along in a, in a straight line. Um, why would your debt stock grow um, starting from there? Uh, what three, three different things could cause the debt stock to grow. The real interest rate could rise, and this is the bond vigilantes. Right? This is what the coalition has banged on about. They've said, if we don't take steps to reduce the debt, the real interest rates will rise, um, and the debt stock will kind of uh, go up. Now, other things being equal... That's, that, that, that may be true, although I, I, I'd argue and we can come back to this, there's no real, there's no real uh, reason to expect our real interest rates to, 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 to rise because we're outside the Eurozone and um, can control our currency, but we can come back to that. But that's only one of the factors at work here. Um, the crucial one is that if growth falls, if economic growth falls, the debt will increase, other things being equal. If you start from a position where it's just kind of... Uh, in a steady state, and also if the deficit rises, which again could be caused by growth falling, um, then the debt will rise. So, so there are those two factors often, often ignored by the coalition. In particular, growth falling has been completely ignored by the coalition, and I'll, I'll show you that with some forecasts from the OBR, um, Government Debt to GDP. Now what this is, um, the moving down, you've got the forecast for fiscal year 2011-12, um, that's the current year, through to 2016-17. And then in the middle column, you've got the June 2010 budget forecast. These are forecasts for debt-GDP ratio, right? So at that point, they thought it would go from 67.2 to 
it would max out at 70.3 and then go down after that. There's no figure for 2016-17 in that, in that column because they only forecast five years ahead. Okay? Now, by the time, 18 months later almost, in the November 2011 autumn statement, that had been heavily revised upwards. It wasn't going to peak in 2013-14. It was instead going to peak at 2014-15 at 78%, right? And then only just to be coming down after that. So, so, so a big increase in the projected debt-to-GDP ratio. Why was that? It's nothing to do with increases in interest rates, Nothing, they, they weren't predicting increases in interest rates. It's to do with declining growth, okay, declining projections for growth. This is the same documents um, showing the forecast for real GDP growth. Um, when the coalition came in, they believed in a thing called expansionary fiscal austerity, the idea being that if you cut, um, confidence will come back and you'll grow. And you can see that in the initial, uh, the initial OBR forecast going from 2.3% in 2011 up to 2.8, 2.9, 2.7, 2.7. Now, what they're saying is, thanks Dave, they're saying um, 2011, you've, gone, you've, you've got only 0.9% growth. Um, and that was almost an outrun figure at that time because they'd had most of 2011 already and then it's going to go down to 0 0.7 and only recover to 2.1 in 2013 and in, it, it, the indications at the moment are that 2013 will actually be worse than that if anything so you can see the effect of austerity in terms of depressing growth is actually making it harder to achieve any of George Osborne's targets for deficit uh, for, for, for debt GDP ratio and that, that I think is the kind of self-defeating nature of austerity. This, um, Anne, Anne mentioned this graph but didn't put it up, but I think it's a nice one to put up. We're, the UK is now doing, the, the current economic crisis, which is the blue line, is now worse than the 1930s, largely because the recovery has been so weak. We are still 4% in real terms below the peak real output uh, which was reached in 2008. By nine to, in the, in the, the 1930 to 34 uh, depression, they had actually recovered real uh, to to the, the kind of gain line, if you like, within four years. We probably will take six years to do that, and we might even we might not even make it for that. And that only gets us back to real GDP being at where it was in 2008. Normally, you'd expect about 2.5% growth a year. That's the kind of trend rate for the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, a similar story in Europe. Um, I won't, I'll, 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 I'll leave that, but basically, if anything, um, austerity in Europe, the impacts have been even worse. I'll have to skate through the last few slides. As, um, as Anne said, austerity has severe costs. High unemployment, um, youth unemployment reaching scandalously high levels now in the UK and the Eurozone. Also, female unemployment, mainly because um, public sector workers disproportionately women, so bearing the brunt of the cuts. Um, there are human costs of that now, and also, um, particularly for younger workers, unemployment has a scarring effect, makes it harder for them to get jobs later. Spending cut cuts in distribution terms are strongly regressive. The paper I presented at Radstats conference last year, done with Tim Horton, showed the distribution impacts of spending cuts fall strongly on the least well-off. Um, because of the collapse in confidence, we've seen a collapse in investment, both government investment and private sector business investment. And we're also seeing uh, the OBRs predicting increasing consumer debt, even from the high levels that Anne presented. Um, they now predict going up to about 161% of GDP, the private sector uh, debt stock by 2016. So there are these huge kind of costs. Now, is it stupidity or malice that we've come to this? The, any economist with half a brain can see that there's no support for austerity in the data. Now, not all economists have half a brain, unfortunately. Uh, so a lot of them are kind of brainwashed into having less than that. But I don't think conservative politicians are stupid. I don't think that's the reason they're going for this. Rather, they're using the crisis to advance a small state agenda that was pre-existing before the crisis hit. Before the crisis hit, the Tories had a terrible problem because Labour always framed the election. 2001, 2005, it was Labour investment versus Tory cuts. 2010 wasn't that. It was Tory cuts versus Labour's anemic version of the Tory cuts programme. And that transformed the debate. Um, we can talk maybe a bit more in the, in the session about why that was. But um, these are some statistics from IMF that Peter Taylor Gooby referenced in a recent paper. UK spending GDP... Uh, as a percentage, UK public spending as a percentage of GDP will fall below the USA by 2015. So we're actually heading for a state that's smaller 
than the US state. The US often seen as the champion of small government, you know, minimal government in the, uh, in, in, in the G7, although that's, that, 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 that's a slightly, you know, uh, simplistic view. But, yeah, we are going for... We are going to be the small government guys in that, uh, in that group by then. So, so there's something very deep ideological going on here. How are they getting away with this? Last slide. Um, we'll talk more about this in the session. The problem is that the maxed out credit card line, comparing the government to a household, seems logical at first glance. It's incredibly persuasive. It's a simple argument. It's a powerful argument. It's difficult to argue against in today's soundbite kind of media debate. And it's the return of early 80s Mrs. T handbag economics, you know, that people, people responded to it back then and many people sadly still respond. The media are mostly sympathetic. They're not all sympathetic. Uh, people like Martin Wolf, Larry Elliott, uh, Paul Krugman and the New York Times are very unsympathetic, but there's still a huge dead weight of people backing this. Opposition within Parliament is weak, um, largely due to kind of split in about how to respond to this in the Labour Party. And something very clever went on with uh, Conservative spin doctors. They managed to spin the crisis as one of government debt, right? rather than what it really was, which was an unsustainable private sector growth model leading to out-of-control financial sector, extreme volatility, um, asset and uh, house price bubbles, subprime debt, etc. This was the big problem. This was why the banks had to be bailed out in 2008, and it's been kind of spun round into this government debt crisis. And that's the depressing thing. So the question is what we do about it, and that's, that's what we're hopefully going to discuss in the session in a minute. Thank you.